Hello and welcome to this review of my Ortec MCK142 Pro. I bought it off eBay years ago and now it's time to finally show it. Just like last week's Focus keyboard, it's what's called a Battle Cruiser, an extra large keyboard which is often laden with extra features, as is the case here. Although all Battle Cruisers are very large, this might be the biggest of them all. At 51.5cm long and 21.5cm deep, it's only a little bit smaller than an IBM Battleship, which is so big it devours almost any desk. Oh well, who needs mice anyway, right? The reason for its stupendous size is the enormous amount of buttons on the keyboard. At 144 keys, not 142 as the name suggests, it's got 22 buttons more than a battleship, and 40 buttons more than an average modern full-size keyboard, even though it doesn't even have any Windows keys. In fact, it has one of the highest amounts of keys on any single keyboard, even compared to other battle cruisers. The Northgate Omni Key Ultra has 120, the IBM 122, the Gateway Any Key 125, the Cherry 2100 had up to 126, and the Focus 9000 had 129, so it sits on top quite comfortably and is one of the bigger ones too. I have keyboards with considerably more keys than even this, but they're specialist keyboards, not meant for the general market. So why does the Ortec have so many keys? Well, apart from the expanded nav cluster, which comes with extra diagonal buttons, which was a common feature on these battle cruiser keyboards, it's got 24 F keys at the top. Oh, and there's another 12 at the side here. Oh wait, and the normal 12 F keys are present too, so that's a total of 48 F keys, that's got to be a record. The idea was that the F keys here were for the people who liked the new position of the F keys that got introduced on the IBM Model M, but they also offered ones on the left for those who were still used to the old XT and AT layouts which had them here. And then the 24 ones at the top were actually programmable function keys, so you could program macros into them, which is extremely useful. According to the manual, it's got 8K of memory and can store up to 320 keystrokes per PF key, which is quite impressive, one of the highest of any of these programmable boards. The amount of 24 PF keys is also pretty high. The Focus, Omni key and Any key only had 12. One problem is the way you actually program and use it though, which is so confusing and nonsensical that without the manual, which I happened to find online, I never would have found it out on my own, and in fact even the manual has it wrong. Okay, so first you double press the select button to switch to program mode, as you can see by the yellow LED lighting up. Then you press the key to be programmed, for example, PF1. You input the string you want, such as 1, 2, 3, 4, for example. And then you press select again, not once, but twice, to switch to menu mode, whatever that means. And then the key is programmed. In order to go back to normal mode, you need to then press select again, which toggles the LED off again. But then you find that the key doesn't actually actually do anything. Now you need to be in menu mode for the PF keys to output anything, but that just makes no sense to me, especially because the keyboard doesn't start up in this mode and neither can you program in it. So you need to toggle to menu mode when you want to execute one of the PF keys, which partially defeats the purpose of them as hotkeys. I mean, who thought of all this? Now compare that to Focus's protocol, which was just program that key with let errors and then finish that key and bam, programmed. And you can use it straight away as well. Aside from that, the programming feature is actually really robust. It works great and it's super useful. I had even swapped the top keys with read legendables as I had wanted to use it at work because if I want to, for example, order a five litre can of technical grade ethanol, you know, for a party or something, it's much easier to just press a single key that says ETOH rather than input 54211713 every time. So I programmed a bunch of standard part numbers, location codes and other acquisition related strings into it but I was disappointed to find out I couldn't use it at work because at work I have to use a Mac and when I use it on a Mac it fucks up the output part way through and then doesn't stop outputting a certain key. Even toggling off the repeat function didn't solve it. So I guess the Ortec just doesn't like Mac OS which probably means me and the keyboard are connected on a deeper level. Like some other boards at the time, it includes a way to keep track of the programmed buttons, which is nice, but unfortunately the execution is extremely poor, as it's just this plastic little 
thing, which is just slide over the keys. You can write the shortcuts in these little boxes, but the boxes are so minuscule in size and it comes off way too easily. And it's also just so hideously ugly that I figured some relegendables would probably be a lot better. There is a small strip below where you can write shortcuts for the F keys, much like the Focus 2001, but they're even smaller and it's really not enough to be useful for the PF keys. In the middle of the, unfortunately quite useless but still cool looking star nav, there's a fast repeat button. It was common for these battle cruisers to put some kind of whimsical function key here in the middle. With it, you can make keys repeat at 20 characters per second rather than the standard 10, or at least the standard at the time. But it's not a toggle button as you might expect, you know, where you just press it once and then everything repeats faster. No, you need to press and hold it down and then press what you want to repeat. So it only does fast repeat for as long as you hold it down in combination with that key, although it doesn't even work in Windows 10. I'll be honest, I'd rather just have a T-Nav and none of this bullshit because this is just weird and not useful. Interestingly, much like the IBM 122 key terminal keyboards, these only ever seem to have been sold in ISO layout, with a vertical enter key and short left shift. I mean, I'm not complaining, but considering the prevalence of ANSI keyboards even back in those days, I'm a bit surprised. Also rather curiously, although the modifier keys have coloured lettering, which was also the case on the Focus Battle Cruiser, they don't follow the standard word perfect convention of colours that were normally used, which was green for shift, red for control, and blue for alt. But instead the shift is blue and the alt key is green. I have no idea why they did this and I've never seen it anywhere else either. The keycaps were made by Tai Hao and their thin ABS, but they came with double shot lettering, which is the most durable lettering, which is good because this keyboard has been used so much that some of the keys, particularly the A and S keys, had actually worn away by a substantial amount. Now this makes sense, as the seller mentioned this keyboard had been his daily driver for 15 years straight, which, yeah, tends to take its toll on ABS keycaps. This one had been in use for so long, in fact, that I correctly guessed from the state and smell of the board that the previous owner drank white wine and had a ginger cat. But thankfully, as you can see, despite how much material has been scraped away, the lettering is still perfect because, of course, double shot lettering is ingrained deeply into the keycap and is therefore virtually impossible to wear off if you're not using a flamethrower or something. That said, some of the more non-standard keys, for which they presumably didn't have a mold on hand, used pad or silkscreen printing, which is not anywhere near as durable, and as you can see, some of them have almost completely worn off. But now for the real mindfuck, even though they're silkscreen printed, they're still double shot. All the PF keys have black silk screen printing as well, but most of them even have a red second shot on the inside. And one has a light brown one, and some don't have any at all. I think they're just double shot blank caps with whatever plastic they had on hand and then printed them later, but it's still pretty weird. Anyway, the bad state of the keyboard was also bad news for the switches, which are Alps SKCM White, a well-known vintage clicky switch. Alp switches aren't particularly fond of dirt or heavy use, and when I got it, I could instantly feel that the key feel was much more rough and scratchy, and unpleasant than they would have been if they had been in good condition. I mean, it worked fine, but it didn't feel optimal. And this, paired with my will to use it in the open office, led me to linearize the switches, which isn't too hard with old Alps boards, all you need to do is open up the switch and take out the click leaves. You don't even need to desolder the switches. I also gave them a good clean while I was at it. The resulting linear switches are smooth, very nice, and feel light and very crisp. They're also a lot quieter, which helps avoid public lynching when working in an open office. But make no mistake though, they still have that classic Alps soundtrack. As for the build quality, it weighs a very respectable 1.9 kilos, which is pretty hefty, almost as much as Model M, but I guess you'd expect that from a big-ass motherfucker like this. The case is plastic, and the switches come in a metal mounting plate. Fairly standard stuff for Alps keyboards, actually. It's quite good, although it doesn't have N-key rollover. 
An interesting thing is that it came with a compartment for holding four AA batteries, which at first I presumed was to keep the programmed keys memorized when unhooking it from a power source, but as it turns out it can remember the programming just fine on its own for at least several months, so I'm not really sure how much this adds to be honest. Anyway, overall this is a super nice keyboard, it's got great switches, 24 highly useful programmable keys even if the way of programming and executing them takes some getting used to, and a layout that's pretty close to modern ISO. I really like it, it's a shame they don't make stuff like this anymore, they pop up every once in a while on eBay, I got mine for £50, which was a decent deal because even back then these were popular boards and commanded a fairly high price, I don't think they've hyperinflated yet though. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.